As you may know, listener, Farmer Phil has a bull called Notable, who had notable behaviour yesterday. So we'll hear about that on this week's show. But I must say, what a wonderful day it is, because I'm back on the weekly sofa with my good old roving reporter, Ricardo. <laughs> Where have you been? I've been on holes. <laughs> I've been on holes. I just, when did I get back? Easter Monday. So um, fantastic. Two weeks in South Africa on the western eastern Cape. Beautiful country, beautiful. I mean, they do seem to be doing their level best to destroy some of it <laughs> along the coastal routes. Bit of mad development going on, but generally, yeah, fantastic. Very really great experience. Some diving with sharks and a bit Ooh. of safari, and went to see Robin Island where Nelson Mandela was locked up. Fantastic, yeah, brilliant. Time. Well, we'll hear about that a little bit later. But we've got next week. We've got coming up a, a roving Ricardo interview. So just tell us about that, Rick. The idea, was, when I went over there, I didn't want a busman's holiday necessarily, but what I wanted to do was I wanted to get an interview from, because uh, Mount Nelson... You don't um, drive one, one a of bus. The, one of the great... No, 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 no we, I don't. Let's not talk about buses again. Let's not go back to buses. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, just that, hang on a minute. Introduction to Farmer Phil. Phil, trying to get in on the bus thing then. <laughs> I don't, honest. No, no, no. And they run on diesel. <laughs> no, no, OK. Well, there he no, is, anyway, Farmer Phil. Three, <clears throat> Um, uh, yeah. A busman's holiday. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So, but, but while I was over there, because the, the um, Mount Nelson Hotel, which is one of the world's great hotels, have got a, a, they deal with a lot of their catering waste with a wormery, at the worm farm at the back of the hotel. And I wanted to have a little interview with the person responsible there, but it didn't come off because they couldn't come when I was there and, and no one at the hotel knew anything about it apart from the people that I've been in contact with previously and stuff like that. So it didn't work. So I thought, well, I've got to get something. You know, I was on a mission to get something. So it happened that the first person that we stayed with in Cape Town was a woman that I'd met at Chelsea Flower Show the year before last and she was really into her gardening and whatnot. I had to check a wormery for her. <laughs> Great, you know. But she had a wormery made of car tyres turned inside out. Fantastic bit of kit, you know, really good bit of DIY stuff. That's ruined can of worms sales yeah, for no, another week. I, I can't. Uh, it's so, so time consuming to make one. It's got oh, to, oh, it's that's to it. a lot more later. <laughs> but, but, um, but yeah, absolutely brilliant idea. So um, she, because she, was, she had various contacts and she, she knew a couple of people that, that were members of the, the, the Cape Town Horticultural Club or something, and one of which was a fellow called John, who was the curator from, I think it was 1963 to 2001 at the Creston Bosch Botanical Garden, 1963, 1967, something like that. So a good long stint as curator, so he does some really good experience. Lovely guy. And he, he was kind enough to turn up, so I had a, an hour, or well, c- probably a couple of hours in actual fact, with him at the gardens, and he kind of showed Sarah and I lots of different stuff. Really interesting stuff. You know, massive botanical gardens, World Heritage Site. Brilliant. So a nice little, nice little interview with him anyway. So in actual fact, that more than compensated from, from an interview with worms. <laughs> 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 so, uh, so I was quite chef with that. And, um, so that's coming up next week. Yeah. And if you're listening in South Africa, because I happen to see we have a dose of downloads from there. So whether, <laughs> you know, they got wind of Robin Ricardo, as it were, on his bus. I did, I did promise to a send coach? a couple of CDs to people. I, right. I must remember not to forget to do that. <laughs> mm. I, I hope anyway, he's not if... going to be charging us mileage to get there. Yeah, that's, oh, that's worth the thought. Forty-one p a mile. He always puts that down. He'll be up at Sam saying three thousand miles at forty-one p. Heather says you're not uh, charging us for your mileage and the mileage you're taking the scooter out in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so. If you are in South Africa and you have seen the wormery working or you have a connection there, we would love to have a Skype interview about that particular worm composting kit. But otherwise, the interview is coming up next week. We've got Farmer Phil in who's going to share some information with us about what's going on on the farm. And we'll find out what Notable was notably doing that was notable yesterday. He's a boy. We have a Monty worm cast. And Richard's going to share with us what he's up to in the garden. So that's this week, but next week, interview time. Now, the thing is, you may note a little stress in my voice, and that's because the office is quite busy I would say in fact I would say 
It's raving busy because the good old Royal Mail allegedly have saved up three companies' catalogues and sent them out all on one day. <laughs> <laughs> and on. there are three companies in the Midlands, and we're one of them, that have had every single catalogue that's going out to their customers land on the day after bank holiday. And those three companies are actually drowning in orders, and we're one of them. But if you're trying to get through, you just carry on, because we will definitely wiggle our way to you. <laughs> right. <laughs> It is case mayhem up there. I mean, I, you know, I, I came in yesterday. I wasn't in the office for uh, for very long at all, <laughs> and uh, for, for good reason. And and I, and I think I'm going to try and stay out of the office as much as possible. <laughs> it's probably best. Yeah, yeah. yeah. For, crazy. for my part, I know that the stress levels are rising because Jodie's little missives to me are coming in ever bolder capitals. <laughs> yeah. What do they say, Phil? Urgent, mostly. <laughs> Anyway, we're, we are very pleased to receive orders, very pleased indeed. And you'll be glad to hear that rat traps, baby, are going out like bilio. Are they going out like hot cakes? Yeah. Yep. Right. And the other thing that's selling is your storm kettle. Oh, cool. Are they going out quite nicely? They are. Oh, that's pretty cool. So yeah. old Roland will want to watch out then, won't he? <laughs> You've lost me, Phil. Roland the rat. Oh, I see. <laughs> He's just so 80s, isn't he? He was just so 80s. I mean, Everybody knows that you do, yeah, no, I thought it was like some sort of Roland or something mm. that was associated you with Storm Kettle in some way. Uh, <laughs> little oh, little 90s spring then. chickens, don't give me that. <laughs> anyway, you received your catalogue yeah. on the same day as everyone else. Oh, I think I probably did. Yeah, I just got it yesterday. <laughs> sat there up as, up as nine at night reading a, reading a little extract or several what, extracts your from, own the, article. from the descriptions <laughs> of the books no no nothing to do no I'm not reading what I write it's uh, shocking <laughs> but, but I, <laughs> I read, Michael edited that I, I, uh, <laughs> he spent hours this is absolutely no no it's, uh, it's, no. it's brilliant no it's amazing that what's, um, what's been written about these books I mean it's a kind of combination of efforts but I'm, I'm assuming that Michael is predominantly responsible for these, these descriptions what have you got well it's it's, the, the one stuck out because I, 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 when Michael described Robin Page, he, he, he said to, uh, to to Robin as Robin left, he said, "Oh yeah, thanks, thanks, Robin. We do need a feature from a curmudgeon on our podcast occasionally." <laughs> <laughs> and Robin sort of looked up at him, thinking, "Not entirely sure how to respond." <laughs> to that. But uh, but it's great because it, it says here the description of, of Robin's book: "Carry on regardless, carry on regardless." We're not sure how Robin Page manages to find the time to be such a prolific writer, as he is also a farmer, conservationist, and publisher. He's even put in a few appearances on the Wiggly podcast but right he does and here's another polemic straight from the heart this time Robin takes aim at all those he sees as responsible for killing the countryside from government ministers to vegetarians few escape his <laughs> wrath this is not for the faint hearted Robin is a cantankerous old curmudgeon <laughs> who is quick to abortion blame and not afraid to ruffle the feathers of anyone who disagrees with him and quite a few of those who agree with him as well for good measure on the other hand, beneath the thickly spread vitriol lies a passionate message of hope and faith in the wonders of nature. We dare you to read it, but only if you're ready to let off steam. <laughs> <laughs> That's superb, isn't it? That really is, yeah. Just great. I'm there. I, I've, my passion is aroused again. I'm yeah, going to go and you, do something. Yeah. Hello. I'm going to go have a little bit notable. That's what oh, I'm yeah. going to do. <laughs> Good Lord, Farmer Phil's off. He's up. He's pulled on it's his It's all that curmudgeoniness. I've got to grow into that yet. Because <laughs> I'm only young. You are, you are. You're not. There's room for curmudgeoning yet. Yeah. Yes, he's got his new cap on. His new wiggly wigglers cap. What are you going to do with this, Phil? Well, I, I, it's going to be a prize, isn't it? I think so. Didn't you say you were going to give it away as a prize? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We're going to have our competition, which is coming up in a bit. And you can win, dear listener, wherever you are in the world, this is open to you. And uh, UK competition rules apply, of course, <laughs> whatever they are. But excellent. Tell me, Rich, about your garden this week. OK. I think it's a time of year, isn't it? I mean, this is balmy weather. You know, coming back from holiday is great because it, uh, I'm walking around the day and stuff. Balmy or it's balmy? Beautiful. Both, in fact, both. Huh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, but it, it's, it's just great. And of course, you know, really sort of inspires you to get your vegetables. I mean, in, in, what I tried to do is do some stuff before I went on holiday as well. So I got the peas in some little planters um, and they all come when I got home, you know, a bit of, you know, got them 
planted them before I put them in the garden because the mice always get them, you know, if you put them in the garden beforehand, just, be just before they sprout. So I've got the peas, they're coming beautifully. Broad beans are coming up through the ground now. But what I wanted to do to make sure I do, one of the trickiest things I've always found to get to germinate efficiently, effectively, right the way across the border, parsnips. So I wanted to get those in because the soil's quite nice and warm now. So I sowed those the other day. Um, the parsnips are really funny, you know, because you can sow a row and you know, one year they'll all come, the next year none of them will come. And last year was really bad for us for parsnips because we had that really cold May. Do you remember? It was bisly. Well, how do you make that out when the only thing that was coming out of our garden for weeks was parsnips. I wonder if they were sowed later on, though. I wonder Probably. perhaps if they were sowed or slightly before we had that really cold spell. Unfortunately, we got them in just before the really cold spell, so they didn't, they didn't come to, to uh, fruition. Parsnips are one of those things that you sow them out quite thickly and then prick them out, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, for, yeah, yeah. For just you, you that reason to, you that to, you get to thin them. good or bad takes. Very, very sporadic germination. But funnily enough, with, with parsnips, if you uh, occasionally, if you leave the odd parsnip to go to seed and then just let them throw their seed at the end of the year and don't sort of excavate uh, around them, then you often find you've little self-seeding parsnips, and that works quite well. So if you're not too tidy in your vegetable patch, you can often have self-perpetuating parsnip plants, which, which is pretty cool. But what I did is, well, I put the parsnip seeds in the fridge this year to give them a bit of a cold blast before I put them out. I mean, presumably they're treated anyway, but I thought we'd try and do that and see if they work uh, previously, I've, it's fiddly, but what I have done as well with parsnips is to put them in the airing cupboard on warm, wet tissue just to get them to, to germinate before I plant them out. And that works quite well, but it's a right fiddle. So, uh, yes, yeah, so I've got the, got the snippage in because you've got to have a good crop of snips. And carrots, they've gone in now. So I, I think a lot of the... Sometimes people plant them... You know, right back in March, carrots and whatnot. But it, uh, I think it's better probably to leave it till we get some warm weather, get them in, and then there's a good chance they will come because to keep repeating sowings is a, is a, is a right pain. So, yeah, I'm kind of looking forward to that. And uh, really, it just made sure I dug up the muck and whatnot. Rachel and I were talking about this when you guys were away, when Rachel and I did a bit of a podcast a couple of weeks yes, ago. Yes, I heard it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a lot of elephant poo on holiday. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> Like bowling balls. <laughs> yeah, yeah, huge, yeah. absolutely huge. So all that, um, any of the any of the muck that was on the garden, we put out on on the winter. My my, my godfather came and stayed to look after the house when we were on holes, and he he sort of dug it all over. So that's quite nice. Saved me doing that. So that's all in the ground now. Lots of lovely organic matter. So um, yeah, I get the sweet corn in next month and French beans, runner beans in next month as well. Not too early. There's just no point in planting them out too early because we, you know, we've got some fantastic weather now, but three weeks time. It, we could have snow, couldn't we? Is this similar to the farm, Phil, or is everything planted? Absolutely similar. We've got, we've got this same conundrum. The weather is fantastic at the moment, and the temptation to go, in our case, planting peas is nearly overwhelming. If it wasn't for the fact that we were so busy doing other things, I'm sure I couldn't resist it. But there is nothing worse for a little pea plant, and this probably goes for a lot of other spring-planted garden vegetables as well. We grow them for vining pea seed. Mm. but you get them to a couple of inches high and then subject them to two or three weeks of cold, wet weather. They get a disease called damping off disease, which doesn't do them much good in any way, but it just stops them. And then when the weather comes nice afterwards, it takes them that much longer to get going again. And we found that by planting them later in warm conditions, not necessarily moist, it doesn't seem that water is a limiting factor, but if you plant them in perfect soil conditions later, they get away and they grow like absolute crazy, you know, really quickly on through May. And then the plant seems to produce more peas and less horn, so less, less stalk. Right. The closer that you can plant it to when you intend to harvest it, it goes to seed quicker. And obviously in peas, because the seeds are the bit that we want and they happen to be the bits that you eat, right. the more pea seed that you get, the better and the less energy that it puts into growing horn. What's vining peas? Vining peas are the peas that are harvested green to make usually frozen peas. So these are the things that firms like Bird's Eye, they harvest and freeze within 24 hours. And you have specific varieties so that they're sweet for a start. So like a garden pea, they're sweet. They tend to be smaller. They're a very dwarf pea, very, very small plant, not very high yield. But the whole trick is to produce a small green pea that goes through the mechanical processing required and damaged. But you're not producing those peas to eat? No, we produce the seed, 
that the farmer who grows the edible peas will plant next year. So if Rich and I go out in the field at the right time, we would get those bird's eye peas. You would, and if you, I, I like them raw because they're small, little small sweet green peas raw. Absolutely fantastic. Yeah, uh-huh. they are we'll do that, Rich. We should. We'll go on a pea trip. We'll, we'll raid. Not, <laughs> not, not too many peas. A, you know. a, pea. a trip for a pea. A trip for a pea. We'll definitely do that. And I've got a great idea for a video cast, which I haven't told Michael yet, but he is going to love this. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not so sure about your uh, idea. No, you came with this one. So we've got to set up a rain butt, yeah. but I think <clears throat> drought buster. Yeah, so yeah. we start off, Rich is in the bath with uh, the bubbles, yeah. oh, did, oh, did, oh. <laughs> and then <laughs> Drought Buster siphons the water out. Yeah, yeah. that's a great idea. <laughs> that's a really great idea. That could yeah. be embarrassing. From the out, with the, the bath, out with the water goes the bubbles, I would suggest. <laughs> <laughs> Brace yourselves. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, listener, if you want to see Richard in the bath, oh, vote Lord. with me. Email <laughs> heather at wigglywigglers.co.uk I think I'd noticed on iTunes that video casts like that get a little label by the side that say explicit <laughs> on yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> oh lordy hell. Um, dates for your diary. I've got a secret date which you'll all be dying to know. Weakest link. Richard records. Oh, right. <laughs> on the 4th of May. But before then... We don't, know, we don't know when it goes out on telly, though, do we, yet? Uh, I won't be telling you. You can you're rely on us to find I out, said, I said, yeah, well, don't. I said, I'm not going to tell you, because you'll just tell everybody. Said, I'll only tell you when you can only tell a handful of people, rather than Perhaps thousands. you'll be a, a kindred spirit with, with Ms Robinson, given that you're both mildly ginger in complexion. So uh, that that, that, Phil, that, you know. that's blonde, <laughs> Phil. I'm not ginger at all. I don't know what you're calling me, Ginger. You've got more wrinkles than she has. <laughs> oh, yeah, I don't have the... I'm, I'm, I, don't have the I don't have the... Smoke he doesn't have to have his face. hair in a bun at the back to come. <laughs> oh, bitchy. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> She's going to get you. Oh, you can... And um, we've got composting day life. coming up on the 25th of April. So if you'd like a space, you need to book in really quickly because I think it's nearly booked up. What will people get to um, find out about on that day? Well, everything they need to know about composting and, and more, That's I would it, say. Then. <laughs> Are you a master composter? Uh, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I would never like to say I'm a master anything. <laughs> but it, uh, it'll be a great day. I'm really looking forward to it. And hopefully the weather will stay... Well, good cer- certainly the group that you had round yesterday um, <clears> on, a, <throat> on a composting fact-finding day found yeah. out a bit more than composting. They <laughs> did. They found out all sorts of... Little little goodies and insights into wiggly life. So um, who came yesterday? We had a, a day for representatives from local authorities primarily. There was there was a, a, somebody came along from Garden Organic as well, formerly HDRA. But the day was really geared to sort of strengthen links between us and various local authorities across the country and to give them a really good insight into, into composting. Interestingly, because uh, we've, uh, we've thought about doing a, a master composting course, because <laughs> you, know, you don't know what you're missing out on, really, so it's worth trying it. But For those people but, that don't know, there's a thing in the UK, and I think it's in the States too, called the Master Composter Programme, and it's generally run by local authorities and um, rap, organic yeah, associations. It, and, and it teaches you to be a master composter. And we've always wondered, should we go on that course? But we had a master composter on our composting course, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, that's right. So, uh, and, and I think the, the sentiment was that we don't really need to think about going on a master composting course. But I, I haven't said that, you know, it might be worth it. But then we'll probably never get round to it. So, uh, yeah, great day, really good day, really worthwhile for all concerned, I think. And the composting day, I, I mean, if people come on the composting day, or rather for those who do on the, come on the composting day, they'll go learn about composting, obviously, but we'll have some treats in store, a bit of farmer fill treat and, uh, and whatnot. Ooh. And on Saturday the 28th, we're really pleased that Jenny Steele's coming along to run her wildlife gardening course in the Wiggly Garden. And it does look a little bit bare at the moment, but by then I think it will have perked up. She runs a wonderful course twice a year here at the farm, so if you want to come, you can call plus four four one nine eight one five hundred three nine one, or you can get hold of Jenny, and her web address is www.wildlifegardening.co.uk. 
Competition time! Competition time! No clues here, but it could be to do with bulls. Listen to this sound and tell us what you can hear. So, if you've got any idea what that sound was, please enter our competition by emailing richard at wigglywigglers.co.uk or leave us a sound message on what you think the sound is on my blog, wigglywigglers.blogspot.com. Now, if you don't know what the sound is, you need a clue. And it's bulls. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it is, and I'm, I'm going to leave it there. And if you really don't know what the sound is, guess anyway, because there's extra prizes for real caucus. <laughs> bulls, Phil, bulls. Bulls, yes, naughty bulls. They spend all winter winding each other up. You've no doubt that we've, we've talked before, they spend their winter in their pens next to each other and they yeah. taunt each other and spar and so on. So this time of year, when we've turned them in with the cows, if one of them's got a cow bulling... And the other one hasn't. What's Next. the cow bullying, Phil? That's when she's ready to be served. They, <laughs> so the one with the bullying cow will try and steer her as close as is physically possible to his neighbouring bull just to wind him up. So yesterday we had this group of recycling officers round and because it happened to be on the way from A to B, we thought we'd show them the cattle on the way. And the, they were, broadly speaking, non-farming backgrounds. The first bunch of cattle... Penguin Quarter, the Aberdeen Angus bull was with, and he was standing in the corner with his head buried in the hay rack, looking very grumpy and very depressed, which is unlike him, because usually, you know, he's up the front telling you exactly how he is. And when I went round the corner, I realised exactly why. Because Notable was in the neighbouring yard, and he was doing his uh, damage to a <laughs> bulling cow, and it had wound Penguin up and depressed him to some extent, and of course all these recycling officers came round the corner to be greeted with one of the natural bovine sights <laughs> of the countryside, <laughs> and notable with a big smile on his face. So that was quite entertaining really, wasn't it? Was, it was, yeah, it was good stuff, yeah, yeah. I think that was an experience that they weren't uh, anticipating. On that note, we'll move over to something a little more classy. Monty, please bring on your worm cast. It's probably a tale of love anyway. Usually it's with worms, isn't it? Yeah. Monty's Worm Facts Worms swallow soil as they burrow and extract nutrients from it. There we are, from one Lower Blakemere small pest, sorry, Mont, <laughs> <laughs> to um, pesticides, Phil. Yep, well, this is the time of year that we plan what we're going to do, broadly speaking, in terms of pesticides and notably fungicides on the cereal crops. And What about none? That would be a good idea. Well, none would be all very well, but th then we would end up with a, a lot of problems. If for our purposes, producing seed, we'd have a lot of problems because some of the diseases actually compromise the viability of the seed we, we produce, so it wouldn't grow very well. So that's a problem. It makes it difficult to inspect and certify it because you've got damaged plants and so on, and it severely reduces the yield. It's very like if you need to take a medicine because you're ill to make you better, that's the same thing as putting a fungicide on a wheat plant. You've it, nicked Robin Page's talk. I haven't nicked Robin <laughs> Page's talk at all. I happen to agree with that sentiment. It's a way of explaining what we do. And so what we're doing right now is collating what evidence we discovered from trials last year with the latest technology to see what we want to use and how we want to use it this year. Because we are firm believers that the very latest technology is the best way of proceeding, mostly because it involves using better targeted chemicals and less of them, and you get a very high efficiency of control of the problem diseases. In wheat, notably, it's a disease called septoria, and in barley, it's a, a range of diseases which have got great names like rhynchosporium and net blotch. That's what we're doing at the moment. And, of course, we're also trying to clear up one or two weed problems left over from the autumn and winter because we've had such a mild winter. 
that the weeds are having a, a huge game and they're about twice the size that we would normally expect them to be. That is also taxing our thoughts at the minute. Interesting stuff. How do organic farmers manage if they don't use pesticides? Well, that's a good question because until recently they've had a derogation in terms of the seed that they produce that it doesn't necessarily have to be organically produced because you can't inspect organically grown seed because all the weeds grow through it and you can't see it and it's very difficult. Right. But that derogation, the, the European Union in our case, are trying to get rid of it. And, of course, this has given them the problem that actually they've got to work out how to do it. They can, but it's difficult, costly, and there's no great certainty of success. So, obviously, if you're planning ahead to to either grow or, if you're a seed merchant, sell a quantity of seed to your organic customers and the crop fails, you haven't got anything to sell. What do you do? Just a minute, you're not saying you can't produce organic seed, are you? No, I'm not saying you can't. I'm saying that it's very difficult to do it reliably. Doesn't that mean you're just a lazy farmer, though? No, if you want to sow a field of wheat, then you need a quantity of seed. If you grow the wheat in pots, then well, fine, you you can certify it and you can see that it's exactly what it says it is. But once you've planted it out into the field, the difficulties of actually killing the weeds by mechanical means, which is what you're talking about can be impossible to overcome. This year will be an interesting year. Because we've had a very mild winter, the weeds are competing very successfully. So that I would imagine that you will see organic farmers struggling this spring to control the weeds, and mostly they use harrowing techniques to grub them out and leave the wheat in between. The problem is that if the weeds are too strong, that they won't be grubbed out. So are you saying that organic farmers are relying on conventional farmers for seed? It's not so much relying. It's, it's because of, it's to some extent the rules and to some extent the fact that conventional farming gives them a consistency of product that they can then start the organic cycle with. If, for instance, the, the whole farming community in the UK were forced to farm organically, wouldn't that be a good thing no, for, no, for you, technology you, that you could have a, a more efficient forms of, of mechanical weeding and whatnot? The, 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 the limitations of mechanical weeding are basically that is it. You can't do any more because it is totally reliant on basically most weeds are broadleaf weeds, bushy weeds, so that they're not straight up and down like a wheat plant. Yeah. And so a harrow will comb those out and leave the wheat. Beyond that, there's not any mechanical means that I know of at any rate that you can differentiate you know if if we had from tomorrow no pesticides and if that extended to beyond Britain you know so say Europe you would have food shortages straight away there is no physical way of producing enough food under those circumstances but wouldn't after a period i mean i can i can appreciate it, things de- do tend to get worse before they get better but after a period wouldn't nature find a balance and be able to deal with the the infestations of certain diseases and whatnot it is possible that you would find a balance and it is possible that you would find some of the older varieties are more resistant to diseases and so on but it keeps coming back to the end thing you can't produce enough food it's fine while a percentage of the market is organic that's great, I've got no issue with that at all. But if it were forced on us, the cost of food would escalate rapidly and there wouldn't be enough of it. Wouldn't but that if, be good if, for you? Yeah, I mean, if, if, the, if the cost of food escalated from, from a sudden happening like that, wouldn't that be good with the, with the situation that you're facing in, in 2012? It might, but it's difficult to measure just how it is. I mean, it is interesting to me as a farmer. I don't choose to farm organically. I know people who do. I know people who do it successfully. I also know that in the current regime, it's not a license to print money, although organic produce is quite expensive. And there are reasons why organic prices have been held down because of various imports from places that produce so-called organic food but not to quite the same criteria that we do and so on. It's quite a complex subject but if you said the whole of European agriculture was going to operate organically under British rules you would have food shortages within months. Now you're going to find the other side of the story because you're off to a very important organic farm in a couple of weeks. With a bit of luck I'm going on a visit to Highgrove where Prince Charles farms um, and we're going we've got a marketing initiative within the Duchy of Cornwall for those of us who are tenants of the Duchy of Cornwall so that we're going to see uh, or hopefully I am a number of presentations there 
they grow organic vegetables, they farm an arable acreage organically and they have an organic Ayrshire, I think, dairy herd. And it's absolutely top-notch stuff, you know, they, they do it. But at the same time, there is the aspect that Prince Charles doesn't have to pay himself rent, which changes the dynamics of yeah, it. Yeah, sure. Bit. <coughs> Perhaps absolutely. you can ask him about that. <laughs> <laughs> He'll probably tell me, have you paid your rent, Philip? Have you? Uh, yes, just. Excellent. <laughs> Brilliant. So next week we've got coming up on the show the interview with the roving Ricardo in South Africa. But until then, I'd just like to say congratulations to Anna Farmery, who's been proposed as having the most valuable podcast. So if you want to vote for her... I've got to go and vote. You've got to go and vote. Mm. I've already voted because I really enjoy her podcast. But if you want to go and vote, go to my blog and you'll see a link. So well done, Anna. And until then... It's goodbye from me, Heather. Goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from me. So, that's this week, but next week, interview time. And the week after that, we're planning ahead so much that we're having a how to set up your can of worms video cast. Really? I think we need to polish our act up a bit. You need to scrub up a bit for that, Phil. <laughs> I see you're looking quite tidy today. I have to say, you've, uh, you know, your jeans need ironing. But that's mm. uh, other than that, you know, you're, you're, um, you don't have another layer of animal excrement. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, the trouble was we were dehorning calves yesterday, so I couldn't live with myself this morning, so we had to start afresh. <laughs> oh, superb.